The Easter Rising, as we all know, was a combination of long-term aims and planning and short-term accidents and circumstances. And by the time the rebels seized their positions on Easter Monday morning, they had no hope whatever of military success. Their aim was to put up a good show, to make a good fight. And in what was one of the earliest and remains one of the best accounts of the Easter Rising, James Stevens's The Insurrection in Dublin, written a, a diary written during Easter week and published shortly afterwards in 1916, Stevens remarks, and this is written on uh, Tuesday, uh, sorry, on Easter Wen Wednesday of Easter week. The idea at first among the people had been that the insurrection would be ended the morning after it began. But today, the insurrection having lasted three days, people are ready to conceive that it may last forever. There is almost a feeling of gratitude towards the volunteers because they are holding out for a little while. For had they been beaten on the first or second day, the city would have been humiliated to its soul. People say, of course they will be beaten. The statement is almost a query. And they continue, but they are putting up a decent fight. For being beaten does not greatly matter in Ireland, but not fighting does matter. And the Easter Rebels' performance was vastly more impressive in military terms than the Risings of 1803, 1848, or 1867. And the British response to the Rising was almost as if it had been choreographed by the rebels themselves. Executions of rebels was obvious. It was expected. To quote Stevens again for the last time, he wrote on Saturday, the day that most of the garrisons surrendered, nobody believes that there will be any mercy shown. The belief grows that no person who is now in the insurrection will be alive when the insurrection is ended, and that on the day that most of the garrisons surrendered. In the event, as we know, in the course of the next 10 days or so, the British shot 15 people, most of the leaders, and others who were relatively insignificant figures. Later, in August, they hanged Roger Casement, a grand total of 16. Some of these were obvious figures, all the signatories. How could they possibly have escaped? Others were less obvious. Above all, Willie Pierce, P.H. Pierce's brother. Why was he shot? We learned only recently uh, when the uh, court martial records, very flimsy indeed, were released. The other rebels, when court martialed, were rightly deemed to have pleaded not guilty because they refused to recognize the court. This was perfectly proper on the part of the British authorities. Willie said, I'm guilty. I was a prominent figure, so they shot him. Stupid, but obvious. And so many of the British mistakes in 1916 and later were both stupid, but obvious. 16 was, by international standards, not a great total of executions. Let's compare it to the attitude, the actions, of two other European states when faced with the aftermath of rebellions. Eleven years earlier, there had been, as we all know, a failed revolution in Russia. In Latvia, this was combined with a movement towards independence of a vague sort. In the aftermath of that failed revolution, 1170 Latvians were shot or hanged without trial. 7,000 were, were <laughs> imprisoned or deported to Siberia. A very harsh response indeed, compared with the British in Dublin in 1916. 21 years later, in 1937, another European state, often regarded as more civilized than Russia, Italy, showed itself even more bloodthirsty. After the Italian conquest of Abyssinia, or Ethiopia, an attempt was made to assassinate the, uh, com the Italian commander-in-chief, and some other Italians were killed. The result, nearly 1,500 executions, 30,000 civilians were killed in Addis Ababa, and many more were arrested and deported. The Easter rebels were very lucky indeed. 
to have Britain as their opponent. But Irish public opinion didn't accept that. There was a feeling that nobody should have been shot. After all, when there had been a small-scale rebellion in South Africa two years earlier, nobody had been shot. Why should the British execute people who had fought in open arms? And the British couldn't understand this Irish failure to accept the obvious, and the Irish totally failed to fit into a pattern that the British regarded as absolutely normal. After all, the rebels had trailed their coat in spectacular fashion by referring in the Easter Week proclamation to our gallant allies in Europe, making it clear that they were on the side of Germany and stabbing Britain in the back when she was engaged in the greatest war in her history. And the executions were accompanied by arrests, often of people who had little or no connection with radical politics for many years. British rule in Ireland had been so mild, so indulgent, so tolerant, that the British authorities hadn't kept their records up to date. And people who had been active in their youths 10, 15 years earlier were rounded up on the basis of out-of-date records. This further antagonized Irish public opinion. And the damage done by Britain in its response to the rising was compounded by a near mortal blow to the Home Rule Party, which jumped at the chance offered by Asquith, the Prime Minister, uh, to negotiate Home Rule now during the war. These negotiations dragged on for two months, resulted in total failure, in the humiliation of Redmond and the Parliamentary Party, in its demoralization. So by the end of the year, public opinion was well underway towards changing, towards shifting from the Home Rule Party towards a more radical alternative. And then, at the end of the year, the new British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, decided to release most of the Irish prisoners, all of those who had been interned without trial. Some of these were prominent figures, like Arthur Griffith. Others would become prominent, though they were yet as yet unknown, such as Michael Collins. And 1917 saw a drift towards political activity. The policies outlined many years before, in 1904, by Arthur Griffith, were now, stage by stage, over the next few years, implemented. And often implemented by IRB men, who until recently had no, nothing but contempt for politics, who regarded politics as a demeaning, squalid activity, and uh, who wanted, above all, to have the chance to stage another rising. But they knew perfectly well that in the circumstances of 1917, another rising was out of the question. As a poor, inadequate second best, they decided to take on and defeat the Home Rule Party, clearing the decks between them, Republicans, and the British government. And some of these reluctant converts soon became skilled and adept politicians. The most notable figure in this category, of course, is the leading politician in 20th century nationalist Ireland, Eamon de Valera, a man who had moved straight, directly, from cultural nationalism to revolutionary activity with no intervening political phase whatever, who had had no connection with the Sinn Féin party until he was chosen as its candidate in the East Clare by-election who rapidly adjusted and adapted to political life, and who soon abandoned military activity. True enough, in the Civil War, he served as a private soldier. What a lowly role for the surviving, senior surviving uh, commandant of the Easter Rising to play. But for the rest of his long, 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 long life, he was a politician, and a very good one indeed, with the exception of the years 1921 to 23. A mass Sinn Féin party was formed, facilitated by further blunders by the British. In the spring of 1918, faced with the prospect of a German breakthrough and a French collapse, the British government decided, against the advice of its Irish experts, including Sir Edward Carson, decided to impose conscription on Ireland. In the context of Ireland, a disastrous blunder. In the context of the war, a perfectly obvious natural move. You might say a sensible, rational mistake to make, but in the Irish context, a mistake, and one that did the British no good. They didn't get any extra soldiers from Ireland as a result, but they antagonized the whole of nationalist Ireland. 
It gave the death blow to the Home Rule Party, which in the general election at the end of that year, in December 1918, won only six seats to Parliament as opposed to the new Sinn Féin Party's 73. Some of those new Sinn Féin members of Parliament met in Dublin the following month, in January 1919, and again implementing the policies that Griffith had outlined in his pamphlet, The Resurrection of Hungary, way, way back in 1904, they formed a parliament. They declared the Act of Union abolished. That parliament elected a government, headed first by Emma de Valera, and then during his long absence in the United States uh, by Arthur Griffith, uh, and that government tried as best it could to administer Ireland, bearing in mind that there were British soldiers, policemen loyal to the crown, uh, and a whole Dublin Castle establishment determined to crush them. Michael Collins proved to be not only very good at killing enemies, but very good at raising money, a brilliant administrator, a difficult colleague, as Peter Hart has pointed out in his recent biography uh, of Collins, but very effective indeed in financing not only the supply of guns to the IRA, I'll come to that in a minute, but also financing government departments. And that government, a government on the run, a government in hiding, a parliament meeting uh, in, metaphorically, attics and cellars. Normally, they met in private drawing rooms. Uh, but they met in secret, knowing that uh, they were liable to arrest at any time, and many of its members were arrested. Collins, as Minister for Finance, had the job of keeping the show on the road in financial terms. And one of his staff, who went around from secret uh, office to secret office, from ministry to ministry, distributing money, acquired uh, the memorable nickname of the Walking Bank. Another story relating to this period, W.T. Cosgrave, along with Kevin O'Higgins, ran the most successful of these underground ministries, next only to finance, that of local government. He was on the run as well, with a price on his head. One afternoon, as he left the office, in Wicklow Street in Dublin. Uh, he adjusted his makeup uh, and his disguise to his own and all his colleagues' satisfaction, walked out onto the street, and was immediately accosted by a beggar who said, spare a shilling, Mr. Cosgrave. People were able to walk around, known to the population of Dublin, and, with some exceptions, escape arrest. It was of crucial importance that this government was able to survive, was able to establish itself, and, a point I'll come to in just a minute, was able to win the at least theoretical allegiance of the army, of the IRA. Because on the very day that the first Doyle met in Dublin, the first shots were fired in what became known later as the Anglo-Irish War, or War of Independence, which in theory, retrospective theory, lasted from January 1919 to July 1921. It wasn't a war that affected the whole of the country. To take the most obvious example, what soon became Northern Ireland was almost entirely exempt from conflict. The IRA was careful not to intervene in Northeast Ulster, for the very simple, obvious, sensible reason that its supporters were a small minority, a majority of the population, Unionist, uh, loathed them, would do anything in its power to crush them, to inform on them, to help the army and the police, and the result of any activities would undoubtedly be sectarian conflict, which would damage the image and the reputation and the effectiveness of the IRA and the Doyle. But other parts of the country, Sligo, Wexford, and many other counties, were almost unaffected. The three main centers of conflict were Dublin City, County Cork, and County Tipperary. In Dublin City, Collins's squad was, as I said already, very good at killing dangerous policemen, very good at infiltrating uh, British intelligence. Elsewhere, small-scale attacks on policemen, initially on policemen, later, only much later, on the British Army, these escalated. The police, the RIC, were seen as obvious targets for two reasons. First of all, they were less formidable. They were less accustomed to battle. Many of the soldiers in the British Army were uh, recent veterans of the First World War. They knew how to use guns. Some of them were very happy using guns. 
the RIC was not. The RIC then was more vulnerable, and in a sense, it was also more dangerous to the IRA, because the policemen were very often locals who knew who was likely to have been involved in an ambush, who was missing on a certain night when things happened. They were the eyes and ears of Dublin Castle. And to use a rather brutal image, the IRA's objective was to gouge out those eyes and cut off those ears to make sure that Dublin Castle would remain uninformed. And attacks on police barracks and on policemen resulted in retrenchment, in the withdrawal of the RIC from a large number of scattered outposts to a much smaller number of easily defensible positions, thereby abandoning much of the countryside to the enemy, above all at night time. One police report said that one-sixth of the county of Donegal, one of the largest counties in Ireland, had become a miniature republic. Then, in the summer of 1920, at long last, the British counterattacked. They engaged in reprisals. They accepted that public opinion had changed, and they decided that the best way to cope with a hostile public opinion was to make it afraid, to make people, Irish people, more afraid of the British forces, of the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, than they were afraid of the IRA. Because the pattern of 1916 had already been repeated by this time in 1919 and 1920. You remember, I suggested, you all have come across these views many times, I'm sure, that in 1916 and 17 there was a retrospective endorsement of the Rising, that people changed their minds, that this change began even in some cases while the Rising was taking place, consolidated by the arrests, executions, and so on. And Irish nationalist public opinion was radicalized. That pattern was repeated in 1919 and 1920 in exactly the same way provoking, luring, encouraging the British into acts of repression that in turn antagonized the public. And Irish nationalists, often dismayed, outraged by the attacks on often unarmed policemen, sometimes shot in the back, switched the target of its resentment from the attackers, the IRA, to the British when the British engaged in repressive measures in banning fairs and markets, in attacking people, sometimes shooting people, beating them up, burning houses, and so on. Reprisals worked from the British point of view. The IRA in many of the parts of the country where it had been fairly active uh, went on the run uh, or uh, vanished, kept its head down, hunkered down and waited for the storm to blow over. But by now, faced with a choice between, on the one hand, the hard men in the IRA, symbolized by Collins, um, Barry, Lynch, and others, and on the other hand, the hard men in the British uh, establishment, Dublin Castle, the Black and Tans, and the Auxiliaries, the great bulk of Irish nationalists supported the underdog, supported our lads against the traditional enemy even though that might have seemed, and did to many people seem, highly unlikely at the beginning of the conflict in 1919. The IRA was forced on the defensive, but this had some positive results for the rebels. Knowing that they were li liable to arrest, possibly to murder, by the auxiliaries and the Black and Tans, active IRA men went on the run. They formed large groups, later called the Flying Columns, and these roamed over large areas of Munster. They were able to carry out attacks despite the British pressure. And it's interesting that while there was a steady rise in the number of those killed throughout late 1919 and the first half of 1920, there was no fall off. There was a plateau, not a peak, and the number of those killed remained more or less steady until the truce of July 1921. But it's important to remember that the war was on a very small scale by international standards. Between January 1919 and July 1921, about 1,400 people were killed. A tiny figure compared with conflicts in so many other parts of the world in the 20th century. 
Think of Algeria in the 1990s, Lebanon in the 1970s and 1980s. It was fortunately a very small number. Even if one takes the whole period, 1916 to 21, the death total is about 2,000. One senior British officer remarked at the end of the conflict in the summer of 1921 that the total casualties in the last 18 months are little, if any, more than many a battalion suffered in a single morning during the war in France. And also that death toll in violence, in conflict between British forces and Irish rebels was tiny compared with the number of Irishmen killed fighting in the British Army during the First World War. The IRA was able to carry on, even if it had to abandon much of the country, the countryside, to uh, its enemies. It was able to carry on fighting. And many people, not only on the Irish side, but also on the British side, felt that they could carry on forever, on a smaller scale, local activities, uh, rather than a national uprising, but that they could not be defeated. And it's significant, and again it brings me back to a point that I mentioned in the context of the British response to the rising. It's significant that British public opinion became increasingly dismayed by the way in which the war was being fought in Ireland, in a pattern similar to that that took place in France over the Algerian War, or the United States over the war in Vietnam, or the Soviet Union in the war in Afghanistan. Lloyd George himself admitted that charges of drunkenness, looting, and other acts of indiscipline are in too many cases substantially true. The opposition parties, Labour and Liberals, the press, foreign opinion, all attacked the British government. Most of the Christian churches in Britain were deeply critical of the British government. The Catholic Church was an exception. It was deeply embarrassed. The Church of England had no such qualms. And many clergymen and many bishops denounced atrocities in Ireland. And at the highest level of all, the king was dismayed by much of what was done in Ireland in his name. And he kept urging Lloyd George towards a compromise settlement. So the military pressure that the British were able to bring to bear on the IRA was matched by political pressure being brought to bear on the British government, reach a settlement. And these combined factors led to a truce in the summer of 1921. Once the British government, dominated by the Conservative Party, even though there was a Liberal Prime Minister, had satisfied the interests of the Ulster Unionists by giving them precisely the area that they wanted, six counties, not four, not nine, six, and with a home rule parliament in Belfast that they could control. And once the backbenches of the Conservative Party felt that we, the government, the Conservatives, have done the honourable thing by our Ulster allies, then, and only then, after Ireland had been partitioned, after Northern Ireland was up and running as a political and administrative entity, then Lloyd George at last turned his attention to serious negotiations, negotiations with the nationalist Irish. A truce uh, was negotiated in July. Lloyd George met de Valera in Downing Street. There was a complete failure uh, of communication, a total, utter lack of empathy between them. But Lloyd George was even then prepared to offer nationalist Ireland vastly more than any British government had ever been prepared to contemplate in the past. Dominion status, the equivalent of what Canada, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand had, with a few exceptions, a few qualifications. Violence had worked. And the British now gave way because of dead bodies in streets and fields in Ireland, gave way to force what it had until then refused to give way to democratic demands, to election results, to speeches in the House of Commons. Negotiations continued by correspondence, and eventually face-to-face -face discussions took place in London. The most famous negative fact in modern Irish history is that de Valera didn't go. He stayed behind, sending Griffith, Collins, and other 
less significant figures to negotiate with a high-powered British team headed by Lloyd George himself, with Austin Chamberlain, the Conservative leader, Lord Birkenhead, and Winston Churchill among the British delegation. From the Irish side, the main objective was to secure as much sovereignty as possible for Southern Ireland, for what would become the Free State. They knew they weren't going to get a republic. That was out of the question, and they didn't look for it. That was ruled out from the very beginning. Lloyd George told de Valera, if you want a republic, go home. The war is on again. It is not on the table. What the Irish wanted, above all, was to remove references to the king, to obscure the fact that they, would fa that they had failed or would fail to get a republic. And for the Irish team in the negotiations, as for the cabinet, the question of Ulster and partition and northern nationalists was a tactic to be used if there was a danger of a breakdown in negotiations. It would be easier to revive public opinion in favor of a war on the emotive issue of partition than over the question of the king, the crown, uh, a disguised republic or whatever. And here, fatally perhaps, the Irish leadership and the Irish delegation was out of touch, out of tune with Irish nationalist opinion. Its priorities were different. Sovereignty for the South mattered far more than any attempt, serious attempt at a united Ireland. The conclusion with the treaty on the 6th of December 1921 gave Southern Ireland effective independence, not of course a republic, dominion status, the same status as Canada, with a few restrictions which were soon and easily removed. And a sloppily, carelessly worded uh, clause, uh, article in the treaty, setting up a boundary commission which would examine the question of the border between the two parts of Ireland. And the Irish claimed, thought, naively, uh, or perhaps lied to themselves and others, the Irish argued this will solve the Ulster question. We will get half of Northern Ireland. We get, we'll get all Tyrone for Manor. We'll get Derry City, uh, South Down, South Armagh. What's left will be unworkable. It'll fall into our lap. As we all know, the reality was vastly different. The treaty was widely welcomed in nationalist Ireland. The, the establishment, the church, the press, the middle classes rallied round it. So did uh, the leadership of the IRB. So did a tiny majority of the cabinet by four votes to three with the president de Valera in opposition. So did a small majority uh, of the Doyle by 64 votes to 57. But crucially, the majority of the IRA was opposed and refused to accept the compromise. The result, independence in 1922, was accompanied by a civil war that poisoned Irish nationalist public life for generations. But that topic, the Civil War, is beyond my brief this evening. It's beyond the time at my disposal, which is about, I think, one minute. So with the treaty and independence for most of Ireland, I will bow out and hand back to our chairman.